Raphael, so good to have you once again. How are you today? I'm well, and it's, uh, yeah, it's been uh, three weeks since I last met. Uh, busy period, exciting things, yeah, and I'm glad to be here. Yeah, it's also very exciting here. We've had very good feedback regarding the webinar that you participated in. You were able to give people practical insights on things that they can do. And today, I hope uh, that we continue with the same conversation. Now, just for the sake of those who might not have been there last month, mm -hmm. I would just want you to bring up the whole issue of what are the key factors uh, to consider when making this decision, whether to yeah. buy or to build. Yeah, we, we uh, talked about four key factors. Um, and these are really four among many factors that people consider. but. These are key main ones, and we talked a lot about location. So, I mean, location for real estate you know, in the world, it's the most important factor. And location will come with other factors that are linked to it. Of course, amenities, that was another uh, factor that we looked at uh, last time. But it's also linked to affordability, because some of these locations you might want to live in uh, might, uh, might have their amenities, yes, but they might not be affordable, so also look at affordability. But really encompassing all this, it's a question of community. The community around you, um, who are you living with, who is your neighbor, uh, can you get along sometimes? Uh, if you're under an issue, uh, can you call for help? So it becomes important. So those were the key f four factors that we, we looked at. Uh, location, uh, talked about affordability, talked about um, amenities, but we also talked about community. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, we, we, you realize that uh, as you make this decision about uh, whether to build or home, it also depends on your housing needs. And this, uh, to a large extent, depends on your stage of life. Mm -hmm. So I remember we talked about building before retirement or owning a home before retirement. There are certain factors to consider. And owning a home for retirement, there are also different factors to consider. Do you want to remind us just a few of those? Yeah, so we said definitely when owning a home before retirement, there are many factors that come into play. But some of them would perhaps do with the place of work, where you're working, and where perhaps even your children will be going to school. So what sort of schools are you considering? So those will influence you. And uh, in this manner, because you might afford a certain school, but you might not afford uh, a particular parcel of land, a acre or even half an acre of piece of land in that location for you to build so you might end up finding yourself at that particular moment renting in as much as it might not have been your initial decision you might have wanted to 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 build but you can't afford to build up in that location that has the amenities that you're looking for or that is closer to your workplace so when you considering really settling down uh, when you're working uh, that whole decision of building vis-a-vis -vis renting becomes very important. And, but later on in life, uh, when you have a little bit more freedom, perhaps you uh, have a bit more cash, you, you find a lot of people might want to settle, and in that case, they are looking to settle. They are, the family is not they just probably a husband and a wife. The children might not be there. And so you might, the needs actually change. You have probably found that you might have needed a five, six bedroom house before retirement, but now you probably need a three, two bedroom, a two, three bedroom house. So the needs change because of that stage in your stage of life. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, I know there's a lot of talk, uh, especially when it comes to home ownership. Some people uh, believe it's uh, not a good decision to rent. But renting is actually an option for a season of life where you might not be able to own a home that will serve you for that season. So you could rent so that you enjoy the convenience. Like you said, your children are able to go to the right kind of school, but you probably will want to retire somewhere else. So it is okay. If you, if you can buy, you can build, but you can also rent. Now, you gave us some very interesting uh, statistics, especially when it comes to the cost of uh, the whole development and the cost of land. Mm -hmm. And I think for those who are not there, they will benefit from that statistic. You can tell us uh, that, uh, that, that uh, percentage you shared. 
Uh, okay, so there's one, there, there are two statistics, I think main statistics that I shared. Uh, one was to help you determine whether uh, a house you're planning to buy, it, probably built by someone else, uh, whether it's actually worth the money you're paying and uh, whether you, you are not overpaying. And I talked about really looking at what we call total development cost, trying to estimate that and adding a 30 or so percent uh, developer margin to just look at the, the apex or the what we call the ceiling of, of in terms of just the total cost plus profit for the developer. Beyond that, then you probably finding that the developer is actually drawing what we call supernormal abnormal profits. Uh, so that could give you hints when you're looking to buy a house. The other statistic we talked about is um, anywhere in the world, but especially so in Kenya, is that land pricing for developments need not exceed 20% of the total development cost. If it does that, it does that to struggle uh, as a developer and um, you, you, you will always realize that uh, you probably not get um, the margin that you're looking for. You will not get the return that you're aiming at. When land pricing as a component of total development cost goes beyond 20%. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. That is very, very important for our listeners to be able to catch up with this conversation. So we will have uh, today's session focusing more on build, uh, but when we do the Q&A session, you, you're free to ask questions on both sides of buy or build. So uh, bearing in mind that the cost of land and the cost of construction is usually high, and especially when you want to buy, there's the super profit element you've talked about. The developers will want to get as much profit as they can. We know that majority of people will end up building rather than buying. So what are the advantages of building other than affordability? Um, okay. Building will realize that at the outset, you'll be able to customize the house or your house the way you need it. Uh, you be able to talk to your architect, your interior designers, and they actually customize the house, give you this exact size of rooms you want, uh, and gives you the layout you want, the orientation you want, on a parcel of land that uh, you want, perhaps. Um, so that that component that you have your own, you have choice in you know, choosing the size of a house, the number of bedrooms, the orientation, the sizing of those rooms, that's important for a lot of people. And that's really, construction will give you that and do not get that um, when you are buying. Uh, so uh, yeah, the second advantage really of building over buying is that uh, for the same amount of money, you probably get a lot more space um, up to from experience, anything 50, up, you can actually do up to 50, 60% more. So if you can afford to buy uh, 100 square meters, um, you're able to actually push up to about 150, 160 square meters if you're buying for the same amount of money. Because in essence, what to cutting off is developer margins, uh, sometimes can be significant. We talk of 30%, but developers are known to to, to go for super normal profit, sometimes even double that, and you've seen that happening a lot in this market. Uh, so you cut off that, and you the same amount of money you actually able to get a lot more space. Um, so that's a real advantage that you have. The other that uh, and a lot of people would look to build, especially in this country, is uh, people who, uh, especially if you introverts, that's something that I've seen. There are people who say they want their space they don't want to uh, once you get into your gate you don't want to be seeing neighbors walking around the door that and a lot of the houses that are on sale in kenya apartments and such are within because developers have to, to to do scale so they are within gated communities um whereas a lot of people building or build on their own compounds they'll probably just wall them off and so you have these four walls and you are alone in that in that compound. So that could be an advantage for some people who would really want to be private and their life is their life. But it could also be an advantage on the other side. 
But those those are the key factors that I've seen people really driving people to to build uh, rather than to buy. So uh, you've highlighted three points. You've talked about uh, customized design. You've talked about affordability, and you've also talked about privacy for those who need privacy. So, what would you consider to be the main disadvantage of building? Okay, um, I, I will actually talk of location um, because you might have this money. You might have. You might actually want to get this last slightly larger space for the amount of money you have but then where you put up the house is not a location which is desirable or it doesn't have the things we talked about it doesn't have a community it doesn't have amenities and so we you start struggling you they are all all alone and then that becomes a very key disadvantage to you actually going out and building so it's, it's location where I can have perhaps a fault and I'll build my dream house might not be offering me the other things that I might be looking for. Community, likely, not, and it's actually community and amenities. Yeah. Okay. So, Raphael, what does it take to build a home? Hmm. What does it take? A number of factors come into play, and these are all interrelated factors. And number one is to have a site, you have to have a location, and it has to be a location that you're pretty comfortable with. Uh, we've seen Kenyans, of course, setting out to, to live, sometimes on their own in some, some, some locations, and you're like, what, what pulled you to live here? And you never get to answer that question. Many times you'll probably find it just that convenience, that somebody wanted a slightly larger home and convenient and probably doing some farming or putting some animals there and such. But the location is a key factor when you're building. So you must have a site. Where is this site? The other things that you need to look at them is the whole issue of really professionals coming into play. And when I'm talking about professionals, it's you you're talking about an architect, sometimes a landscape architect, uh, you're looking at engineers, and engineers, engineers here talking about civil and structural engineers. You're talking about mechanical and electrical engineers, uh, all those coming into to play. You're talking about that quantity surveyor. You also be looking at an interior design designer to really help you in fashioning the interiors of your house. So professionals become a key component towards really success of you building your house. But outside of this, that factor that you come into play and it's key, it's, it's finances. So you might have this dream, and, but if you don't have the money, if you can't afford that dream, um, you will not build. You might have the site, you might have the consultants, and you might have, have money to actually pay the consultants, but then you don't have the money to build or to actually actualize your dream. So those are very key uh, factors to consider. Uh, and they're, they're interrelated. But I always tell people, always, uh, to start with finances first. Because when you visit an architect, you need to discuss the budget. And you need to, from the outset, you need to tell the, the architect, this, um, this amount of money I have. Many times the architect will be able to advise and say, with 10 million shillings, we'll probably be able to do uh, or a 250 square meter house or maybe 200 square meter house or we can do a b c d to give you a certain type of house uh, if you're saying it's five million and won't say i measure it i i mean the architect might actually at the very outset say you might not be able to achieve that with the budget that you have and then it's either for you to lower your expectations uh, and probably go for a smaller house or to wait out and really save up and get the money or get other sources of finance. But it is important to, dis to initiate that discussion with the budget in mind. And then now the budget will actually inform even the design the architect will go for. Uh, it, it's critical because it's from the, the budget that I would know uh, the sizes of the, the size of the, the house I'm designing 
the sort of materials I'm going for, the type of finishes perhaps uh, I'll put in there, and even the construction methodology, all this uh, really is, uh, the, will speak to the finances that we have. Right, that is good. So you've talked about a building site, you've talked about a budget, you've talked about a team of experts. But let me bring about the whole issue of design, because I think it's also something that you need to consider. You've alluded to it in a, uh, in a, in a bit when you talked about Marshallnet or a bungalow. Uh, when it comes to design, um, of course there are things like uh, the floor plan, uh, house plans, that is how do you want the layout of your home to be uh, but one of the things i found interesting is you need to consider such things as the side the sun rises from and the sun and where it sets why is that important okay yeah so there are factors that when as an architect i visit your site and that's why it's always important there let me let me start from this then. when i sit with you as a client Apart from visiting the site, I will first want to hear your aspirations and to note your dreams and what you really want. I have to know that and so that we walk the journey together and I have to really listen to what it is that is in your heart. Uh, but outside of that, when I do a site visit as an architect, there are things I'll be looking at. I'll be looking at the topography of the site, for example. Where does it drain? Um, it, because I'll give you an example. There's a site we worked on in Ruda, and the, the way the site, the topography falls, and where the drainage has been put, the common drainage, uh, we realized we had to raise the house significantly from uh, really in terms of how we positioned it, because we needed to drain it outside towards the gate. And to drain it outside towards the gate um, uh, meant quite a bit of hard works that were done and elevating the site um, because if we had drained it the other way, the way the land falls, you realize we'll be draining to the neighbor's plots and that will definitely bring in conflict. Uh, so topography is key. The other thing I'll look at when I visit a site is where I position the house relative to where the sun rises and where it sets as well as how the really I, I also look at weed diagrams and see uh, how the weed flows on that particular site. The reason it's important to consider the sun, what we call the sun path, is because I want to position the principal facades or principal openings of the house away from the north and eastern facades because those sort of get in a lot of heat into the house, especially you can imagine if you have your main lounge really facing the western sun in the afternoon and you are there on a Sunday afternoon hosting guests and there's all this heat and all sweating around and the place is so hot you might even be forced to use ACs. So when I position it, the, we position the principal facades really facing what I would call the northern side or the southern side and any other spaces, especially ancillary spaces, stores and such, those could face now the eastern and the western sun. So that component of positioning is key. The other thing I've talked about is wind, and wind is key because then in Nairobi we sometimes experience what we call directional rains. So you have rains that are hitting at a certain angle and those will follow the winds. So if I've given you this oh, big opening in, uh, in your lounge, probably a big lounge, double volume, and then it's facing the direction that the wind flows and when it rains it's directional rain and it has to wash in, in into your into your house it becomes a problem so that's why that side visit is actually very key it goes, gives me a lot of information that i need to extract but i also look at other things like uh, amenities i talked about drainage i also look at where power is i look at where i could draw um, uh, things like water from so all those are factors that i'm when i'm considering uh, really a site and building on a particular site, I consider. But also, it helps me look at where to actually position the house. Because uh, one thing we've realized and in Nairobi, unfortunately, is that people build these big houses and they don't have any external space. Or where if you have external space, you just do a, a concrete jago. Whereas, I would prefer where I position the house and actually give you a lot of external areas that you actually even enjoy, you're able to post on and you're able to 
you know, to, to actually, it becomes an extension of the house. So it is important to actually do that site visit for your architect uh, at the point when you start to build. Thank you very much. I think you're just uh, emphasizing the, the same point you did last month when you talked about the importance of using professionals. I don't know whether people in the villages out there actually engage professionals to do the drawings. I don't know how they come about it because sometimes you go to a certain home and you find like the bedrooms are so small and so squashed uh, or there's just something not right with, with the house plan. So basically what you're saying is uh, you should ensure that you, you get a professional, they visit the site and ensure that the house plans will suit the family. Uh, so the other thing maybe when it comes to design you would have to think about is the stage of life where you are. I believe a young person who's maybe starting their family, they might need a design that would accommodate more family members later in life, uh, which could be different for people who are going into retirement. Mm -hmm. what, what are some of the things that you can contrast for those two uh, life stages, the kind of housing that they would, the kind of design they would go for? Okay, yeah, so if you looking at younger days when you're most likely starting a family and you hosting a lot of friends and all that, and all these friends are actually more like your age mates, so they are, they are families and all that, you'll find that you go for a lot more in terms of uh, living areas and we want to actually look focus on living areas from the kitchen, uh, which needs to be sizable. You coming into the dining that can accommodate quite a number of people, and then the living areas. And you find younger people actually go for even in some instances double lounges even on the ground floor. So you have one principal one where you can host uh, say uh, families, but you could have a secondary one even on the same floor and even a family room, an extra family room. So you have almost three lounges in the house but it's really speaking to the stage of life because you are doing a lot of hosting you have a lot of uh, family members visiting or friends visiting but then more often than not you realize also you target slightly smaller bedrooms especially for the children because especially these young children they don't spend a lot of time in their bedrooms they just actually want to get in sleep wake up and they're out so you, you are focused in the bedrooms, you don't have to give them outsized bedrooms. Uh, and even for you as a couple or as a younger um, um, uh, family person, you might not, your focus at that point might not be necessarily in this very large bedroom because through this you might not be spending a lot of time in, that, in those bedrooms. Whereas what we've seen now when you age and you probably get into retirement, um, you find the yes, in as much as one slightly large and slightly large uh, lounge, relatively large, um, because you still probably be hosting your family and all that, you other rooms like um, you like your main bedroom, uh, be, it also starts becoming slightly larger because you this the truth is you spend a lot of time perhaps in that room. Uh, remember, you probably not actively working so. It's, it's a space you spend a bit of time on. So the rooms, especially at that point, uh, the bedroom, your main master bedroom, and then the main living areas, those will need to be sizable because that's that's why you spend a lot of time and those are the those are some of the areas you also need to host. Whereas now the secondary bedrooms, again, will not necessarily have to be very large. Um, or where you thinking of, um, say, if you have to really house them within your room and you're thinking of your grandchildren, for example, they are coming in to visit, you might find you go for one or two big rooms, you have these double deckers and you place them there and that's it. And you cut a lot of the other needs that you might, you know, needs for extra rooms that you might have in retirement. Yeah. Uh, great. So depending on your stage in life, uh, the sizes of certain rooms in your house could differ. And as you age, again, what was not uh, so important might now become very uh, important. But there's something else that I have come to notice. When I visit new developments mm -hmm. lately, one of the things I'm finding is the open kitchen spaces. Now, I don't know. I, I keep wondering how well does this work? Because I assume I'm entertaining a lot of people or I love my, my lifestyle includes hosting and it's one open space from sitting room to dining room to the kitchen. I mean, yeah. how, how does that play around? 
Yeah, typically, because the, this culture started in the U.S. where even today, uh, the U.S. houses are largely one big space, especially to, talking about the dining space, the living room, as well as the kitchen. It's just one big space. So there are no demarcations, especially in terms of walls. There might be demarcations in terms of materials and finishes, but not in terms of, say, walls, really breaking and closing off, say, the kitchens. It's become a very recent uh, attraction in Kenya, and a lot of people are going for open kitchens, open plant kitchens, where you having the kitchen flow into the other spaces. Now, practically, in, especially in our environments, I've seen a struggle uh, with that. Uh, I've actually seen a few, two or three people closing those kitchen, kitchens, especially uh, where they have bought a house and they've realized it's not as functional as they would have expected. Uh, and the challenges because of privacy and, uh, uh, and given our environment, that privacy becomes very, very key. Someone doesn't want to be in the kitchen and she's being seen cooking or the, the smell is flowing all the way. But it all depends still with the family. So what the practical solution that I've seen people doing uh, in this market is to have double kitchens. So you have what to call the wet kitchen, the dirty kitchen, and the... Uh, it's attached to the main kitchen. And the main kitchen now becomes a showcase, just a showcase and finishing. So you probably have food just warming it and it's served. Uh, and I've seen that really almost everybody now building, especially in, in your typical, who is building a typical 300, 350 square meter house and above, who in very likely would be asking for those double kitchens. Uh, and it's to deal with that practical solution that you asked about. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, I recently visited such a home, and like you said, it's, it becomes more of a display kitchen while the real work is happening in the back kitchen. Okay, so the, the, the open space or whatever lifestyle that uh, design that you might want, I think it's good to work with an architect, and I believe uh, probably as you, you develop or you build that home, you can make provision for closing it should you need to actually close it later. Yes, and there's... Uh, the other things that we as architects we can do in orientation, I can actually, and in, I've done that in uh, several designs where I've opened the kitchen into the dining space and the dining space opens into the living room perhaps. And, but based on the design, somebody could be in the kitchen and doing you know, the cooking and everything, but you can't see. If you have, a, if you have friends even in the living room, they're actually not able to see what's happening in the kitchen. But if you cross over to the dining, then there is that direct connection and you can see what's happening. So there are those solutions that your architect will be able to provide you uh, with to really bridge that gap. Uh, great. So I, I want to talk a little bit more about budgets and, and the budget will also go in connection with the, the building site. So there's once I bought a piece of land where I had hoped to build my retirement home and uh, I have since changed my mind. But one of the things I learned from the people who were adjacent to me is that there was, um, they needed to excavate so much. It's like there was a, a heap of sand or soil that had been placed on the piece of land. So if you are to build, the cost of excavation was going to be very, very significant. It was going to change the budget that I was mm. going to use. So how, how can I, as a lay person, get to know that? Because uh, how do I know how far the bedrock is? Uh, what are some of the things, practical tips you can give somebody who is shopping for a piece of land to look out for? Okay, typically in Nairobi, there are, there are several types of soils that you see uh, cutting across the, the greater metropolitan areas. But the two principal ones are red soils, which are on the upper side, really talking about Kiambu, Karen, and such locations. Um, and then there are some areas where we have uh, a lot of black cotton. In the lower sides, talking about um, some areas like Machakos, actually part of Kiambu itself, or Mahaloiro, uh, going all the way to Kajiando, you get a lot of black cotton, but also get some areas with Mara but it's largely black cotton and uh, red soils in Nairobi. Now, the, the challenge a lot, of, a lot of people have is when they are buying a particular parcel of land, 
they, they don't look at other factors, especially if you're buying for construction, it's always be good to have an idea of the soil type you have. Number one, um, as a rule of thumb, it's good to, if, to just, if you're buying a particular parcel of land anywhere, just observe what your neighbors have done, the excavations and your neighboring plots, or even talk to them. Ask them how deep did your foundations go. Uh, it is that 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 conversation can actually help you make uh, save quite a bit of money, or uh, avoid making a bad decision. So observe the, the neighborhood, and unfortunately, um, it doesn't necessarily hold. You might find your neighbor only needed to excavate black cotton up to a meter a meter deep. But on your site, it goes to four meters because that's the formation really uh, of soils. But it is good to have that in mind when you are buying, um, you observe. What we realized is the locations where there is black cotton, the excavations can be as much as um, six, seven meters. I, I know a situation where somebody excavated what, would, uh, what turned out to be a basement. They had to actually build a basement and they are not... They, are, they had a plan for that initially and uh, basements come with their own challenges because you have to waterproof them, you have to support the soils, so you have to reinforce the, the, the walls themselves and it becomes very costly and you are not planned for that. So it actually, as you've indicated, hits your budget. So please observe, if you're especially buying something to build, it's always good to have an idea of the soil structure um, that is exists within that neighborhood. Right, great. So very, very important to visit the piece of land before you buy it. We know very many people who buy land without seeing it first. I would encourage you, it will save you a lot of money or probably you'll be well informed even as you go into construction. Now, still uh, relating to, 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 to budget and the kind of house that we built, we see a lot of what we call white elephants. So you started building a house. Uh, it was supposed to be 100 square feet or 200 square feet. Then it kept on growing and growing and growing. How would you advise people to handle that? Um, stick to their plans or, or how would you... What do people need to do? Because it's a very, very common problem. Yeah, I actually always tell people, listen to your consultants. Uh, because the, any change that you make costs money. We've seen a lot of clients on sites uh, coming with ideas, uh, probably picked from internet, or you visited your friend, you picked this, and you come and tell the architect, I want a change here. Any change, especially that you introduce while the construction is happening, and any change, and saying any change, will have an impact on the budget and more often than not the impact is actually negative uh, so any additions that uh, you do uh, any change in terms of specifications and materials that you, you do all that uh, as a client will have an impact and many times it might mean that you actually demolishing what is what's been built so you pay for what you've already paid for say a wall that you need to demolish but you need to either push it and do another wall, that would have an impact, by the way, on the structural characteristics of your home. Uh, and the engineers now have to reinforce some other areas because they, and when they, we did the planning, we are not planned for a particular wall to, to go at, to a particular section. So I'll give you an example. I might have planned for a wall to, be, to sit on another wall upstairs. So it's... It's sitting on a wall which is downstairs, there's actually a beam running there. But then you want to actually to come and move that wall perhaps to the center of, uh, of a slab. And that it starts introducing stresses on that slab and it becomes challenging. And the engineers have to start thinking of how do we reinforce that particular part, uh, part so that it doesn't sag or it doesn't crack or such. And all that actually costs money. So white elephants come because at the outset, uh, based on the budget that you have, things um, just didn't work out. I always tell people also to have a margin of safety um, up to about 10% in terms of the, the budget. It's what we call contingencies. 
in many times we do five percent the qs will give you a five percent contingency but if you're planning and i'm planning with you as a client i always tell you please work with ten percent put so if your budget is 10 million shillings um i tell you in the back of your mind please have an extra million shillings elsewhere the qs will factor in is five percent in that contingency that will help you finish the project if not you'll probably be left with these white elephants uh, that Rose is talking about. Yeah. And uh, so that is what you're calling contingencies or even making provision for costs to overrun? Yes. And, and I can imagine those people probably who started building last year and now the, the cost of inflation has actually gone up. So I believe uh, what you're buying for cement, probably the price is much, much higher. Yeah. So when it comes to budget, you must factor in contingencies. You must factor in, unfortunately, what we've seen, especially between last year and this year, is that uh, in as much as people had factored in contingencies, they were not enough. That margin of safety was not enough in uh, a lot of cases because you found we find still doubled in, in price uh, in a matter of three, four months. Uh, really, if you look by the smallest bars, about D8 or thereabouts, at like close to 500 now and it's going to close to 1,000. Uh, I mean, it's very hard to absorb those costs. The same for cement. Uh, cement was uh, rose from 500, 550 to about 750, 800. So you have that range and it's happening so quickly. Then um, you have inflation and, uh, that is also hitting other components of fuel and delivery. So transport costs went up because fuel costs have gone up. So even delivering other materials uh, became more expensive. Uh, and then at the same time, because we import a lot of things, uh, the shilling is depreciating again is the dollar. So all these factors have actually made the last six months quite difficult for a lot of people uh, in terms of construction. So if you didn't have a significant margin of safety, uh, what you're seeing is a lot of stored uh, projects. Wow, yeah. that is very, very important. So just like we say in personal finance, always prepare for the unexpected. Always maintain an emergency fund. But when it comes to such a plan, then you need to, it's, it's not, it's no longer an emergency. It should actually be part of your plan so that you're not surprised. So I believe since people will have a chance to ask questions, there's one point I want us to discuss. Must we build homes made of stones and cement? I mean. Why, why is it that uh, we don't have non-traditional methods of construction? In, in developed countries, we see Americans, they live in wooden houses. Uh, why can't we do it here? Um, yeah, so the whole story of alternative uh, construction materials, it's been a debate in this country for the longest. We've seen a lot of this coming. We've seen alternative materials coming to the market. Um, uh, we've seen things like uh, expanded polystyrene, what we call EPS panels, coming into the market. Uh, we've uh, we've seen people using concrete blocks in lieu of uh, the traditional masonry that we use. Uh, in some areas, people have tested using saw blocks, um, but all that has actually not taken traction. Uh, part of the reason is that stone has been relatively cheap in Kenya. Uh, we're only getting to a point where now. Uh, if you, uh, because of other factors coming into play, stone is starting to become uh, relatively expensive. Uh, but if you look at EPS, EPS has not been a necessarily cheap uh, construction method. Uh, but it's actually, we say it's alternative, it, but it's not cheaper uh, than stone. Uh, what I would probably think of an alternative that would perhaps be cheaper would be concrete. Uh, in this market, but nobody is actually using. Uh, okay, let me not say nobody. I think a few uh, big scale contractors and developers are actually now toying with using uh, concrete. But concrete, you can do small walls and reinforce them, and uh, it, it's cast quite fast because you cast the wall as one. So we're seeing this uh, affordable housing developments uh, like in Pangani and all that that are coming and we're actually casting with concrete. Uh, uh, using uh, aluminium panels as, as homework. So that is an alternative technology that's coming into the market that is relatively cheap. Now, it's not necessarily cheaper for you as a single developer to actually go for, 
for, for that, for those panels. Because we need to buy the panels first, and then it's in those panels, and the panels have to be formed. They come in standard sizes. So the architect has to work with those standard sizes to give a house that many times could be a modular house. It might not meet your customization uh, requirements. So that becomes a challenge. Kenya, we bless with stone. Let me put it that way. It's, it's in Africa, I think perhaps it's only Kenya and I think either Algeria or Morocco that has this natural stone that we have, the Darugo stone that we can cut. Um, and so it's proved to be a relatively cheap compared to a lot of other materials, uh, save for soil blocks. Now, soil blocks have not taken off because people think that the walls are not strong. It's soil. We will like, but they actually stabilized soil blocks. If it's what we call a framed structure, start, such that it's supported really with, uh, with columns, concrete columns, and the walls are just infill, even those soil blocks actually do a fantastic job. And that, uh, there are a few developers who are using soil blocks now to cut costs, especially for rent housing. Yeah. Wow, thank you very, very much. So <clears throat> I think I'll leave it there to open up for uh, discussions, uh, but maybe as you summarize your parting shots, uh, what would you want people to uh, be careful about? What are these common mistakes we see when people build their own homes? Okay, I always say, please always, the first thing is, um, if you have alternative sites that you're considering, it's always good to ask a consultant, speak to your architect, uh, because the architects will be the principal planner for that, for, for your house on that parcel of land you're considering. Talk to your architect, let your architect even be there to guide you in the buying process. That saves you a lot of these headaches later on in terms of planning, in terms of construction and all that. Uh, and many architects, if it's an architect you have a relationship with, you be free to accompany you. I don't think this is anything that they will really charge for because probably they are looking at later on um, undertaking a project with you on that particular parcel of land. So if you have alternatives, speak to your architect before you buy, but also stick with your consultants. Uh, visit the architect before you start planning. Talk through, let the architect listen to your dreams and your aspirations. And uh, I, one of the things I'll tell you uh, for houses, let the spaces flow as freely as possible. When you're going as part of the brief, as a client and you're speaking to your architect, let your architect make the spaces flow in, in such a way that you're actually killing you know, corridors, these dead spaces, because those dead spaces are unusable. Uh, there are areas that you find that they become, they accumulate a lot of clutter, they are unlit. So, as you having that, initiating that discussion, always insist on really spaces that flow into each other, uh, large openings, that is very key because you really need to as as much natural light as possible to the house. Let, don't go for these small windows, then you are inside there and uh, you're struggling. Actually, windows, as a rule of thumb, should take about 30%, at least 30% of uh, of the, the current room space. So if you have the walls at uh, 10 square meters, let your windows be about 30% uh, of that 3 square meters, at a minimum. So insist on that. But then, as you walk this journey with the architect and actually customizing, designing something you, you enjoy living in, uh, listen to the really uh, to, to, to the advice of these consultants, the architects, the QS, the engineers that are working with you. And then ultimately when you start to implement this on site, uh, you're building with uh, your contractor perhaps um, uh, minimize uh, making changes. And because I've seen those changes, especially in some situations, actually it's contractors who come and tell you, we can do ABCD, we can cut off here and all that. And then you realize the engineer comes and says, um, this, this, uh, given what's being being done on site, uh, it can't carry the load that uh, we want. And then now you have to go back into repairs and all, and it becomes very expensive. So what the journey with your consultants. And ultimately you will realize that simple decision of working the home ownership journey with these consultants will help you save uh, significant loads of cash.
Thank you.